So as I think I mentioned in the first couple of episodes of the show, poop has become a very central part of my existence. But that is because of the tiny ones. Those tiny ones are really the key to my existence. Not so much what comes out of them and into their diapers and how we progress with housebreaking. Oops. Potty training is going. No, it's really about them. And so it might not surprise you to learn that the question of how I can guide these two tiny people to become good and kind human beings is really always at the forefront of my thoughts. I know it's early. I mean, they're one and two, but I think all signs point to the fact that I'm failing miserably. With the little one, or more accurately, the little or little one, I'll admit that it's probably my fault. I mean, what do you expect when you give a one-year-old her own cell phone? For the record, I am strongly against indoor sunglass wearing, but I make an exception for the under fives, especially when you're training them to wear the damn things because you only go out once a week because of COVID and you don't want to get outside in the stroller and then have them start crying and whining to go back inside because it's too great, it's too great. <laughs> but back to my point about the cell phones, I think I may have spoiled a little one. I mean, the big one, big in quotes, doesn't even have his own cell phone. But does she appreciate what she's got? No. She wants mine. Now I'm thinking that there are a couple reasons. First of all, maybe she's noticed that her cell phone has never had a charge. Maybe it's because she's noticed that mommy's cell phone, which would also be a hand-me-down, comes with a wallet case. Every time she gets her hands on it, she takes up my cash, my Metro card, I have a donation card, my ID, my ATM card, and my credit cards. But if you find her hours later, she'll be clinging to one of them, only one for dear life, the credit card with the highest spending limit. How does she know? And what is she buying? The last option I can see is that she's aware of the fact that her cell phone is a 5C, which as we all know, is 5 cheap. She can't talk, but clearly she has expensive taste. Now I have to be honest, the big one also presents some concerns. When he first started talking, I heard a lot about, I need, I need. Okay, he had a limit of vocab. But then one day he learned the word want, and he started talking about what he wanted. Well, I didn't get what he wanted fast enough, so all of a sudden we're back to, I need, I need, I need. Well, no, you don't need a third pouch of applesauce, especially not after one pouch of yogurt and Cheerios on top of all of that. And? You also don't need to cry face on the floor, kicking and screaming because your mom cut off your tab. For all your child services employees, I just want to remind you, we are talking about applesauce, not beer. But as somebody who likes to watch home renovation and decor shows, let me put this for you in HGTV terms. I'm not looking to raise a kid who's gonna become the kind of person who at some TBD date is going to go house hunting in some Tony neighborhood with great school system find an amazing house with a great open concept kitchen living room combination, separate formal dining room, enough bedrooms for each kid to have their own, an amazing master bedroom with just a spa of a bathroom and an additional room for an office guest room combination, who then is gonna be so spoiled as to say, nope, not good enough. I need at least one dedicated office, ideally two a separate guest room, a separate exercise room, a dedicated playroom for the kids, and a finished basement. Oh, and let's not forget the must-have man cave and separate media room. No, that's not the kind of person I'm looking to raise. Which brings me to a shout out that is probably long overdue for parents, especially single parents, who are living in tiny New York City apartments, who spent weeks or months locked down with multiple kids in these, again, tiny, tiny spaces, like the multiple families I've heard about with four kids in a one bedroom apartment. You guys are heroes. If I wanna hear about needs, I want them to be yours. Incidentally, I've become convinced that the big one doesn't really understand the concept of earning things. 
much better than his credit card stealing little sister. And yes, I am calling my baby a kleptomaniac. I'll be honest, I used to feel a little gypped when daddy got all the credit for the toys our son got. Because between the two of us, I was responsible for about 90% of the toys. And that meant that first of all, I had to do the research to make sure that they were safe, not only for the big one, but also for the little one. Then I had to read the reviews and then I had to ante up. So I got a little jealous when I kept hearing, daddy buy this, daddy buy that. But more recently I've begun to realize that there is an upside to this. Our son really loves trucks and- What's this? My cross. Ambulances and carses. Carses. He could spend hours looking from the windows or browsing online for them. So we'll scroll through, I don't know, maybe two dozen fire trucks and about half of them he wants to buy. Well. A while back, he was sitting with Daddy looking at fire trucks and pointing out all the ones he wanted Daddy to buy. Daddy turned to Mommy. He said, well, the first one he wants is $648,000. I said, I assume it's refurbished? Well, newsflash, yes, it was pre-owned. Anyway, may not shock you to learn that our combined income has never been $648,000 before tax. So if Daddy's responsible for buying him all this stuff, I think he's selling his dad down the river for a fire truck sometime in the future. I'm getting all scot-free, I guess. But the good news is things are looking up for my husband as of late. How so, you may ask? Well, when our big one and I were scrolling through buses, he said to me, and I quote, I need a school bus. Can I buy a school bus? Can I buy a school bus, mommy? I wanna buy a school bus, school bus. Now in that case, he was prepared to ante up. And on top of that, this time he was talking about a toy. The toy school bus cost $8.99. I mean, $8.99. A couple of years ago for the holidays, he got 10 bucks. So daddy's in the clear. Anyway, the list of major mommy fails seems to grow by the day. Maybe we have to show ourselves some compassion. So welcome MJ, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me, EJ. Thank you. From what I know, you went from a 15-year career in the international art world to suddenly being a student again. And then once you graduated from law school, you were at the bottom of a very large totem pole, very prestigious, uh, very old uh, New York City law firm. And so there, I believe you focused on IP work that is intellectual property. Can you first of all tell us what it was like to go through the process of going back to school and reinventing yourself first as, first as a student, then as an entry-level employee in a completely new field? And obviously that was a pretty big leap, so what led you to it? And I might take your questions in reverse orders. What led to it was I was working at a museum that had gone through a lot of institutional changes. It had gone through a merger with another organ, with another museum, and then had demerged. So went through a business okay. divorce. And as a result of that, had a lot of, of uh, institutional and, and also legal issues associated with ramping up again. I was an administrative officer at the museum and gravitated very quickly to legal work, being in negotiations of releases and the executive director said like, you're really good at ne negotiations, you should be in all these meetings. I also started uh, reviewing every contract and more and more so I started working with lawyers on the museum's board of trustees, working with outside counsel, discovering that I loved the work. Through this roundabout route, I discovered how much I really enjoyed that whole field. Um, and talked, I talked to you know, 732 at least people about mm -hmm. the decision and, and about the, you know, something that no one could predict, but to talk through, so, so do you think I'd be employable? You know, I'll be in, in my 40s when I graduate law school. As opposed and, to some people who are 25. Exactly. And do you think I would be employable? Do you, I, and one thing that I recognized is that the museum that I was at at that point, which was a small to mid-sized museum, every single week there was a legal issue that came up. I knew 
that at a minimum I could present myself, be a consultant to museums because it was obvious that there was that, that need. And I had, I mean, I had that comfort because I was leaving a job. I was going to incur an enormous amount of debt and right. um, uh, to come out of law school and not be employable in my mid forties having left a career is a scary thing, but yes. I you know, weighed those risks. And again, I think knowing, knowing that there, there was a value to the skills that I would gain mixed with the experience that I had before gave me that comfort to go ahead with it. What was it like for you being a student with people who were maybe 15, 20 years younger than you? I, for whatever reason, I adjusted really well i mean you know the other they respond to you also i you know i recognized that while i may be you know old enough to be mother to some of the people that i was <laughs> in school with and older than a lot of my professors as well in terms of knowledge of the law we were on an equal plane when you were interviewing you were interviewing presumably you know for your first job after law school, you were interviewing with people who might have been like partners at law firms and for people who don't come from a legal background. Um, usually at these big firms, you become a partner somewhere between like your seven or 10 uh, of practice. And so you're, you're basically 20 years out of college. Some of these other people are like 12 years out of college. So they're partners already at firms and you're interviewing to report into them as like their most junior person. And, you know, I had a friend who when her son was a, a preteen, um, you know, he needed more attention. And so when he was about, to, I don't know, 10 or so, she took three and a half years off. And then she struggled to go back into the workforce because she was older. She felt like a lot of people weren't going to give her a chance. And the places that were going to give her a chance, um, they wanted to pay her peanuts, but get the benefit of all of her years of experience. How was it when you were just even interviewing with them the partners who were, you know, the junior partners who were very young, um, but had and, and knew more than you, obviously, as a lawyer, but you could run circles around them in terms of life experience. So, you know, I feel for your friend. Um, I think the one distinction is that I wasn't re-entering the same career. That I was re-entering a new career where I was, despite my age, a junior attorney. I was a young attorney. I was- And you when I was had a, hum, a humble enough air to not assume that you knew more than people who were just younger than you, but at the same experience level. Exactly. The challenge that I discovered with the larger firms is that my, you know, I did get interviews um, and I wasn't, I wasn't picked up by the big mega firms. Mm -hmm. I'll never know exactly why. I just won't. But I have heard from recruiters from those, um, you know, in conversations, informal conversations years later, that they tend to look, you know, I, I was, I was a, you know, a, um, I was different. I was years, right. years older, and they are looking for like replaceable parts. You're kind of saying that they wanted to kind of cycle, they, they cycle people through a little bit and, and it's easier to get more out of fresh blood, fresh meat. Exactly. And I think too, that if you're uh, putting myself in the, sh in the seat of a recruiter, your job is to provide a labor force to part to the firm, to the partners at the firm and to bring on, you know, um, I'll just to use letters X, Y, and Z. And then you have X, Y, P and Z. Like the P doesn't, doesn't fit. The other side of it too that the recruiter told me is that the large firms are also highly risk averse. Mm -hmm. And so I just was a bit of a gamble because I wasn't like, like so many of the other people that were interviewing. Right. I did with the firm that ended up hiring me um, is which uh, was a mid-sized firm. I got lucky in that several of the partners in that firm, law was a second career for them too. They had worked uh -huh. in, they had worked as authors uh, or in publishing or in other, in other fields. So they got me. To the other point, I was working with the head of the firm 
uh, we were the exact same age. The, some of the attorneys that I wor was working with that I'm still friendly with are um, a decade or more younger. So after a number of years at this firm, uh, which again uh, is actually one of New York City's oldest and a very well-renowned firm, um, you decided to open up your own shop. What was it like to go from employee to business owner? And how did you get the word out that, you know, you started your own shop and, you know, clients should come to you now? And then was it especially challenging in the early days? And, um, you know, what were some of the challenges or did you have just success from minute one? While I was still at the firm, it was encouraged to bring in clients and I was at least among the, the junior attorneys, I was one of the better ones at it. One thing that I did encounter is that, at least within my network, walking into a law firm uh, on Park Avenue um, was a bit intimidating. And also, I could imagine being on the elevator going, I was like, how much is this going to cost me? <laughs> you know, and so, and so it, it wasn't always the right fit. It's right. now absolutely the right, the right fit. Um, most of my, uh, a lot of my clients are in uh, startups, are in the creative fields. We infrequently meet. Most of the work is done by phone and by email. Um, I often will go to my clients themselves. And I love, uh, I, I still love the freedom to work with my clients in the way that I want to with, and I also love the freedom of doing the work in the way that I'm driven to do it without the pressure to essentially make money for somebody else. My operating expenses are, you know, a world apart. I paid attention to that. I'm, you know, I, I don't, I have um, a virtual office. I don't need it. I don't need a, I don't need to pay rent at an office and I don't need to pass along those costs to my clients. And um, so, so in terms of, you know, some, some practice tips, I think ever more and more so in, in a whole variety of professions to take advantage of, you know, virtual offices um, and all sorts of services that are offered online. Right. Make, um, can cut your, can cut your expenses. Um, uh, and I was, you know, you asked about challenges. The first year and a half was, was scary financially, was scary. And so I, you know, I'm glad that I had started small, that I had started very, very lean, um, didn't overinvest, um, did some bartering. I think I had mentioned to you that the video on my website was filmed and produced by a client of mine for whom I had provided legal services. I know that one of the things that you found as a business owner is a greater measure of freedom. It means that you can choose which legal representations you want to take on and you can have a little bit more freedom and how you use your time. And some people use this to follow a side passion like photography, painting, whatever. In your case, first of all, you've used the time that this has created to pursue your passion for social justice. And you've also woven it into your practice. Um, you know, I, I've talked about how, um, particularly now when, you know, fewer people are spending money. And so the spending power that we have, you know, every dollar is magnified. The Amazons, the Walmarts of the world, they're vying for every dollar we have to spend. We can use the power of the purse to try and, you know, affect social change and have these big companies hopefully adopt just policies. But I think that this can apply to small businesses and that, you know, some people are gonna to wanna to shop and give their business to people and small businesses that share their values. You've actually managed to, if you're going to say social justice was your hobby, you've managed to incorporate it into your business, not just as a value that your business supports, but actually as part of your practice. Can you speak a little bit to that? Absolutely. And to speak to that freedom, I had uh, started to become aware of and then active in a um, uh, movement for Black Lives or the Black Lives Matter movement 
in 2014 when I was still at the firm. And it was something that I needed to hide. Um, I needed to hide it from the, the, um, uh, from the partners because um, assumptions that we had different political views. Um, and it just wasn't appropriate in that context because who knows what their, the clients felt about that. You know, all along the way, I've, I've, had, I've had friends and um, friends and acquaintances who've provided really good advice. And a friend of mine, when I was one, among uh, friends of mine that I had talked to when I was just in the part, beginning of, to put together my business is just sort of reflected back to me. It's like, you know, MJ, you, you've got an incredible story. You've got this, this art background, and then you also have this community that, that you're part of and supporting, and the, the law being, you know, some, somewhat like a center of a wheel around that. Mm -hmm. And two, you should tell your whole story, like stop hiding. Right. And, um, and so I, you know, in the ways that the, the social, the social, um, social justice issues come up in my work is there are certain, there are certain principles from that, that political movement work that I bring to my practice in the way that I treat my clients. Mm -hmm. uh, around transparency, around um, around uh, respect, and so on, in in a less you know typical arm's length business relationship. But don't you also do some work like uh, with the Freedom of Information Act requests, which maybe you can explain to the audience what that is? Absolutely, <laughs> and and then that's the absolutely thank you. That's the other side of it is then because I, it's not just a value. I mean, it, it, it's it's important. It's not all small business owners are going to be able to make this like a part of their actual business model, but they can adopt the values as you mentioned, mm -hmm. like like you, how you treat your clients. But some can some can bring it into their business model as you have. So if you could just speak a little bit to that, sorry. No, absolutely. So yes, I do a substantial amount of legal work supporting, supporting these issues as well. So including, like you mentioned, freedom of information law or freedom of information act work. And that is the, every government record mm -hmm. is presumably the public's, we pay for it, so on, we should have access to it. It doesn't always work like that and a set of laws needed to be uh, enacted to govern how and when agencies must turn over those documents. It is a, an important tool for journalists using freedom mm -hmm. of information law in, in order to request documentation from agencies like, let's say the FBI. I mean, any, any agency. You know, it's not every agency wants their records to be seen. And so it can be a contentious process. Often it's through suing an agency, for example, the FBI on the federal level or the New York City Police Department in New York City is the way that you end up getting those, getting those records. Got it. And so I was involved in particular in a, in a case that took over three years obtaining records showing that the New York City Police Department, uh, despite its fervent and repeated denials that it had any documents related to surveilling the early Black Lives Matter protests in New York City from late 2014 to early uh, uh, 2015, mm -hmm. after three, three and a half years, we obtained over 800 separate records showing a very sophisticated surveillance operation. And this is just, you know, one of many, many examples of this. In addition to freedom of information law, I also provide IP, uh, IP services to, to activists and to creative people within, within the movement, largely around copyright and trademark. So one last question for you, if I may. Um, do you have any advice to people in general who may be thinking about switching fields and or starting their own businesses, any kind of like words of wisdom to help kind of just, if it's like a, a scale and they're, they could stay where they are kind of uh, in, or in the field, if, if, even if they need to look for a new job in the field versus kind of uh, 
going to the wild west and you don't know what's waiting for you. The, the great unknown. Um, any key things that, you know, would be part of your assessment. Also now knowing what you didn't know at the time you made your decisions. I think two things stick out to me. One is your, that change may find you and that may, you know, and, and so what I'm, by phrasing it like that is what I'm pointing to is, um, I think given the, given the risks, it, it, it should, it should be something that you are passionate about. We're wired to do, to reinvent ourselves. I believe that. And so to be open, to be open to that, even though it may not seem practical because then you do the work, right? You're, you're driven. Like, right. I want to make this happen. How do I do it? Well, I made a joke about, you know, the 700 some odd people that I spoke to. I spoke to everybody I possibly could. And, and to, um, and, and what that is, is the way that you phrased it as this, you know, wild, wild, unknown West is that right. you then start to learn the landscape and to understand it even before you go there so that you can plan and understand and, and then really assess the risks. Okay. And, and by also speaking to a lot of people, you're building a community around you. Find out as much as you can about the field, about the prospects of your getting, of your being able to succeed in it, and, and how. Wonderful. MJ, thank you so much. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thanks so much, EJ.